So to set the stage here, I'm going to go ahead and log into this project that I have. I've already created this project with some basic resources, and as you can see, we're using an Olympics theme for, for today, since you know they do after they do start tomorrow. After all, um, you'll notice that I have four different runners in the hundred meter dash here, along with some metadata, you know, weight, height, etc. And of course, I had to add a little bit of flavor here and adjust the runner GIF based on the height of the athlete. I can also select these runners. So if I click on the runner here, you'll notice it'll filter the table over here to that runner in their top 300 meter times. If I clear that out, you can see all of the times across all four of these runners. So pretty basic app, but I wanted to create something that we could utilize throughout this webinar to showcase some of these tips. So now that we have an idea of the whole project that has been created, Let's go ahead and light that torch and kick off our first feature that we are highlighting today. And that's going to be the tag reference tracker. And by the way, there'll be plenty of forced Olympic puns to go around today. So definitely fully embrace the cringe. So I'll go ahead and escape out of the slides here and bring that over. And we'll go ahead and bring the designer over here since that's what we'll be in today. So the first one, like I mentioned, is going to be the tag reference tracker. So the tag reference tracker, it came out in 8134, and it allows you to track where tags are used across a project, whether that is scripts or views, even like indirect bindings that don't list out the full tag path. And so to access this tag reference tracker, we can actually right click on a tag. You'll notice I have a UDT just a runner UDT with four instances of that UDT. So if I go ahead and right click on, let's say this weight tag and go to view tag diagnostics here, it's gonna bring up this window. Uh, now this diagnostics tab is actually, it's already been in the platform, uh, but the tag reference tracker adds this active subscriptions and this reference log to the table. Um, or to the view, I should say. Um, and so the active subscription shows us where we are using the, the tag. And you'll notice that it's in my webinar project, which is what I have in perspective and my views and then my runner view. Over here, you can actually see even more details. It goes from perspective views runner. It gives you the root container, any, any uh, you know containers that are inside of that root container. And then all the way down to the property and the, what type of binding that is using that tag. And so that's a really handy way where we can see where this, this tag is being utilized. In fact, we can even, you know, hey, I wanna dig into this tag a little bit and edit that. I can double click on that record and it's going to bring up my view here, right? And so that's one way that we could utilize the, the tag reference tracker. The other one is the reference log here. I'll clear out my existing logs and then uh, I'll go ahead and what I want to show you here is the reference log is going to give an instance of where this tag is used throughout either the client or in the designer. And so what I can do is if I throw this into preview mode and maybe I'm going to change uh, Usain Bolt's weight from 207 to 208 just temporarily here uh, and I refresh this, you'll notice that my reference log uh, brings up a usage or, or a log of where that uh, tag was used in my project. You'll notice it's a write usage. And this usage actually could be either reads or writes, subscriptions, configuration changes, et cetera. So quite a few options here. Of course, we can also clear that log out on the right-hand side, but quite a few options here uh, as far as the tag reference tracker. And the other thing that I'll mention here is that this may need to be turned on in your gateway as well. So if we go to the gateway and we go to our config and go to gateway settings, this enable tag reference tracker uh, needs to be enabled, right? In order for uh, the tag reference tracker to work. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to mention is uh, kind of sticking along with the troubleshooting and the diagnostic theme, right? The next item is going to be the help diagnostics view. So this uh, window allows you to see a lot of different statistics as far as 
the designer goes, right? Over here on the right-hand side, you can see these statistics apply to this instance only. For gateway statistics, go to the gateway status page. So this is for the designer specifically. And there's a lot of information on here in the, these different tabs. I'm not gonna go through all of them. There's a lot of content. Definitely feel free to go through these on your own, kind of cruise around, see what's there. But two that I'll highlight is this performance, right? You can see how much memory we're using, uh, or maybe the tag throughput, etc. Another one is this thread viewer, which lists all the active threads, uh, or the, I guess all the threads and their state of them, I should say. And the reason I'm highlighting this is you may use this, or I should say you may come across this if you call into support and you're having designer issues. The support rep might ask you to save a thread dump. What you can do here is just going to save those threads as a JSON structure to your local file system. Then you can upload it to your support ticket. So that's a, a handy way to grab threads there. Next up, we have some UI tips. So the first one that I'm going to mention here is the tab index. So tab index, it came out in 8139. So relatively recently, in the last couple months, um, and it allows you to specify what happens when you press the tab key on your keyboard, right? So traditionally, um, Perspective uses the logical draw order of the component, or in layman's terms, uh, top to bottom of the view. So name, country, weight, height, etc. Right. But say you wanted to mix that order up, you can do that with tab index. So if I select, for example, on this country text entry, and I scroll down all the way over here to the right hand side of the bottom of my meta section, there's a tab index property. Right now I have it set to one. If I click on my name text entry in the same place, tab index is set to two. So instead of going down from Jamaica to 207, when I hit tab, it should go up back to you same bolt. So uh, I'll be selected in Jamaica, I'll hit tab, and sure enough, it goes up instead of down. So that's, a, again, a way that you can specify, you know, your tab index or your tab order across your UI. I'll also mention here along tab index, along tab index lines that by default, this is actually not a part of meta, but you can come down here to add meta properties and properties and add tab index there. There's also the DOM ID, which just a really hot tip here. DOM ID would be maybe useful for um, using uh, an automatic GUI tester Python library like Selenium or something like that, or if you want to do some automated testing, the DOM ID would be a unique identifier across the DOM, which is uh, the document object models, what that stands for, and that's how a web browser is rendered. So the DOM ID would be it's a unique ID across that DOM. So another property there. The next thing that I'm going to mention, and this one I use all the time, and if you aren't aware of it, it's going to save you a ton of time. So traditionally, to get to a component inside of a container, you would have to deep select that container. That could be done by you know either right-clicking on a container, you notice the little compass icon goes to that container, or right-clicking and deep selecting that, right? And then once that's deep selected, you can select the component or components inside of that container. Well, in 8.1.26, we added a Alt-Shift-Click hotkey that allows you to drill all the way down to the components at the lowest level. So I'm hitting Alt-Shift-Clicking, and it's going to those text files and the text that I have specified in that. So there's no more need to double-click and click into the container, et cetera. Alt-Shift-Click goes directly to that. So extremely helpful, really handy to use. In fact, this is actually a part of several different keyboard shortcuts that I'll highlight. We have them all listed here in our docs. So you could absolutely visit this page after the webinar if you forget the things that I'm saying. But you'll notice at the bottom of this page, you have a deep selection. Um, selects into a container, and that's the Alt Shift click. That's the one I mentioned. But there's a whole host of other ones here, right? A couple that I'll highlight F5 toggles preview mode in the designer, F10 uh, launches a client. So those could be handy. In fact, I'll just go ahead and show that right now, right? If I, I'm in the designer and I hit F5, right, toggling my preview mode up there at the top. So definitely take advantage of those. The next one I'll mention here, it's still in the UI theme you can actually double click on 
a either a label or a button to edit the text inside of it. So you'll notice I just double clicked in the name. I can hit backspace and hit enter, and it's going to actually update the properties, the text property uh, over here on the right hand side. So instead of having to go over the properties every time, you just double click into that, hit enter, or make your update, hit enter, and uh, off you go. So that's really handy. Uh, maybe save you a couple seconds and going over to the properties on the right hand side. Uh, the other one that I'll mention while I'm on this label, I might as well mention this while I'm here, is I actually have these labels over here on the left hand side. Uh, all set to grow zero, shrink zero, and basis auto. So specifying basis auto actually automatically changes the width of that label based off of, in this scenario, based off of the, the text that I have in it. But you can also do this with containers and pretty much everything. It's going to be based off the content that is inside of that component. And so while this is maybe not the best use case of this, right, all this text is static, it's not changing, I could absolutely just specify a width. Where this might become more useful is if, say, you're using, um, you know, dynamic text inside of here where you're querying something, running a script, and after an operator clicks a button, that text could be something different every time you view it. Uh, this auto will automatically grow and shrink based off of the text that is in that. So definitely a handy tip there for you as far as grow, uh, the basis set to auto. The last one here as far as kind of UI is concerned, I have a couple other styles uh, tips, but as far as UI is concerned is you may or may not be aware of this one, but this one's really handy too. If you right click on a property that already has a binding specified, right? it's an indirect tag binding uh, going to my name tag. Uh, if you right click on a property, you can actually copy the binding. So that would include all of the binding, any sort of transforms if you add in there, any scripts, mapping, formats, etc. You don't want to copy this. This is going to copy the JSON structure. You want to make sure you copy binding. And I'll just add another custom property down here and paste that binding. Again, don't paste here. You want to paste the binding. And that's going to paste that binding exactly the same as that text binding that we had. And so uh, that might not be exactly what you want, but then you could just go ahead and and change, you know, the um, the the tag path is at least in my scenario. I'm going to mount my weight instead of my name, and now there you go. You don't have to redo that whole binding. So really handy if you are have a lot of scripts and, and things uh, specified on your uh, on your on your binding. All right, like I said, styling is next. So there are built-in styles that you can use across your project. Um, this is an example of what I'm what I'm doing here is on the root container. If I come over here to the right-hand side on the properties, you notice I have a lot of styles specified. One I'm really kind of focused on right now for this webinar is the dash dash neutral 30 color that I have on my background color style. Now, obviously dash dash neutral dash 30 is not a hex code, right? but it is rather a CSS variable that we can take advantage of. So this color represents a different color based off of the theme that we are selected within Ignition. So the theme is specified on the my session properties inside a perspective right now, it's set to light. Let's say I change this to dark cool, for example. I switch back to my runner view, you can see it's obviously a lot darker, right? It's using that dark cool theme. And so no matter which theme you use, it's going to change the color that that col the, the, the color that is actually shown. So you can see where these th colors uh, or what these colors are on, again on our docs page. Or notice here's my dash dash neutral 30 color, right? Here's all my um, different themes that are built in to Ignition. And so whichever one I select up here is going to obviously, you can see it changed the color that is used within that theme. Now you notice there's a ton of other colors, right? So we've tried to basically put as all the colors that you're ever going to need in an HMI SCADA application, including things like quality of a tag or query or whatever, an error, there's warnings, right? Blues for info, text, et cetera. So quite a few options. I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, just helps, uh, honestly, it just, makes your uh, project better because then you can just take advantage of the theming that's built in to the platform. I'm going to go ahead and switch that theme back to 
maybe do a light cool just just because okay and so that's that's styling and but the last major tip really that i wanted to mention here is the uh, system.perspective.send message some of you uh, probably a lot of you are already aware of this uh, sending messages probably some of you aren't and uh, what this allows you to do is send a message from you know one event to a corresponding message handler right it's made up of those two parts the sending and the message handler uh, and this allows you it allows you really to pass data around a perspective view without having to use all the in and out parameters you know especially if you had Im embedded views inside of embedded views a couple layers or something you don't need to tunnel those parameters all the way through just use message handlers and so an example of that if you remember on my on my view that i showed earlier my session that i showed earlier where i can click on a runner that filters a table that is being done with message handlers so if i configure the event that happens when i click on this gif You'll notice that it's a really basic script, right? This one right here is the system perspective that send message. I'm sending the select runner message is what I've named it. This can be custom to whatever you want. And then you're passing a payload or a set of data along with that. And obviously that payload is specified right above here. It's a JSON structure. So you can put whatever information you want in here. I'm just putting the runner uh, as my key. And then essentially what this is, is the name of the runner, right? So I'm sending the select runner and sending the name of the runner along with that. And then if I go over to my main view and I select my table, right click on this, configure events, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sure you all have done that a thousand times as well. Clicked on events instead of script. But here's my select runner uh, message handler. You see, I've specified it here. And literally all I'm doing in this, I create a really basic script to say, hey, set my uh, table filter text to payload runner. And that's it. So it's a very easy way to send data again across a perspective screen.